All right, here we go with the Chapter 7 homework review. I've got the average score posted there, 8.78 out of 12, although average homework scores don't really mean a whole lot in this course, but there, there's a the number if you're interested. And that we're getting into the last third of the course now, so we have um, just three more chapters to go, four more, or four or five more homework assignments. I think there's actually two in Chapter 9, so five more to go. Um, so we are rounding into the home stretch. So this uh, assignment covered most of chapter seven. There's a little bit that's still going to be on next week's assignment, the stuff about energy and fuels that we talked about in class last week. But everything else on chapter seven, all of the, um, you know, delta H, heat, work, thermochemical equations, Hess's law, all kinds of stuff is going to be covered in this assignment. And we'll try to do problems on, on most of those topics. All right, so the first thing we'll get into is a question about change in internal energy. This is kind of the first concept we covered in chapter seven. And it says, what is the change in internal energy in kilojoules uh, of a system? I think this should be in joules. I, I messed up this question, but anyway, so we'll do it in joules just to make it a little bit easier. Um, I think that's what the question asked for. But what is the change in internal energy in joules of a system that releases 147 joules of thermal energy to its surroundings and has 44.4 calories of work done on it? So in problems like this, when you see change in internal energy, and then you see something about work and something about heat, we should automatically think of this pretty simple equation here, delta E equals Q plus W. So it's a very simple equation on the surface. We just have two numbers you have to add together, but there are gonna be two keys to doing this correctly. So one is we have to get the sign of Q and W correct, because they're not gonna be necessarily stated in the problem with plus or minus signs next to them. We have to read the information in the problem and decide what the sign of Q and W is. And in this problem, we have to make sure we're doing them in the right units, in this case, joules, because they're both given in two different units. So let's look at what we have then to make sure we're getting the numbers right. So here we have releases 147 joules of thermal energy. So thermal energy is a synonym for heat. So heat, thermal energy kind of mean the same thing. And it's releasing 147 joules. So in this case, Q is gonna be 147 joules, but then because it's releasing heat to the surroundings, that makes it a negative number. Okay, so we're gonna use minus 147 joules for Q. That's the number, and then when we're releasing it to the surroundings, that means the sign convention makes it negative. And then for the work here, 44.4 calories of work done on it. So work is gonna be 44.4 calories, and because it's done on the system, so the system is releasing heat and it's having work done on it, that makes it positive. So we have to remember those sign conventions for these types of problems. So whenever we have work done on the system, W will be positive, but then we also have to get it into the same units as Q. So the answer we're looking for is in joules, so both of these terms, Q and W, need to be in joules. So we need to remember that there's this conversion factor here, 4.184 joules per one calorie. Now you'll also recognize that number as the specific heat capacity of water, which is not by coincidence because the specific heat capacity of water is one calorie per gram degree Celsius, or more commonly in this course, 4.184 joules. So that number is also the conversion factor between joules and calories. So when we multiply that out, uh, hang on, I messed something up here. I never work these numbers out ahead of time and then I regret it. All right, so that's gonna be 186 joules. So that's the number that we're gonna add. So finally, we can just say delta E is Q plus W. Q is minus 147 joules. And then W is 186. So that comes out to what? Plus 39 joules, I believe. I did the math right. Yeah, 39 joules. So delta E equals Q plus W, you're just adding two numbers together. We have to make sure they're in the right units, you have to make sure you have the sign correct using the information that's in the problem. So there were some problems like that. Now most of the rest of these deal with the, the other topics in chapter seven. So it's gonna be um, heat of reaction, things like this. Now this one here is one that um, we actually originally covered it in chapter three and then they brought it back and actually now the book has it in chapter seven so we came back to it in class recently. 
which is using bond energies to estimate either delta E or delta H for a reaction. So here we're giving you bond energies for X2 and CX. These two numbers were variable in the problem, so you could have had different numbers for these, but um, you still do the problem the same way. So 173 kilojoules for X2, 249 for CX. And then we gave you the bond energies of carbon-carbon single bond, carbon-carbon double bond, which are 338 and 604. So we want, with that in mind, we want to estimate delta E for the reaction below. So when we're using bond energies to estimate delta E, what we need to do in this case is twofold. So first we have to make sure we know which bonds are present in the reactants and the products. Um, and so we have to make sure that we have sort of a handle on those structures. And then also we need to remember the correct equation to use, which is in this case for bond energies, reactants minus products when we're using bond energies. So for these types of problems, we need to sum up all the bond energies on the reactant side, sum up all the products on the, react on the product side, and then we're going to do the reactants minus products. So the first thing is we have to make sure we get the right bonds present. So for C2H4, when we, when we write formulas like this, C2H4, we're going to symmetrically distribute the hydrogens over the two carbon atoms. So C2H4 would look like this, with two hydrogens on each carbon. But then what we need to do is make sure we complete the octet on carbon. So carbon only has three bonds in this arrangement, so it's going to get a double bond. So that's important to make sure we're using the right bond order for carbon when we're using the bond energies that are given. And then we have X2, which is just X bonded to itself, so that one is easy. And then the product, C2H4X2, again, we're going to distribute things evenly. Um, I mean, there are multiple what are called isomers of this compound, so it doesn't really matter if you draw it exactly right, but each carbon should have four bonds, and so what we end up doing is we're going to put the most symmetrical arrangement. It's going to have two hydrogens and one X per carbon, and by doing so, we now only have a single bond of carbon, because in this arrangement, carbon already has four bonds, four single bonds. It doesn't want to have any more than eight electrons, so we stop there. So the first key in this problem was to get the bond orders correct for the reactions and products, and especially for the ones that involve carbon, that one was, was fairly important. So now what we can do is we can sum up the bond energies on the reactants and product side. So we'll do reactants first. So on the reactant here, we have one carbon-carbon double bond. So we're going to take one times the bond energy for carbon-carbon double bond, which is 604. It's that second number there. Let's make sure we use the right one. And then we have four CH bonds, one, two, three, four. And for, for this approach, we're counting up individual bonds to make sure we know how many of each we have. So we have four CH bonds. And CH is not given here, is it? Hang on a second. So CH is not given to us here. So that presents a problem to do this numerically. So let's just call that x for now. We're going to see that that ends up not mattering. So this may have caused some confusion for some people. It actually caused a brief moment of confusion for myself as I was trying to wing this problem in this review. Um, we don't have exact numbers for CH bond energies. Now what we're going to find, and we're just going to call it x for now, and we'll see how it works out mathematically, both the reactants and the product side have four CH bonds. So we actually don't need that number because remember we're doing reactants minus products. So we're going to take four CH bonds on the reactant side, subtract four CH bonds on the product side, so we actually don't need the number for CH. If we had it, we could still use it and put it in numerically, um, but we don't have the exact number, but we don't need it because there's the same number of CH bonds on the reactants and product side. So that was something that we didn't exactly give you here that may have caused a little bit of confusion, but we're going to go forward without it. We'll leave it in here as X and see that mathematically we don't actually need the number. All right, and then on the reaction side, we have our XX bond, which is labeled here as our X2 bond. So the bond between two X atoms is 173 kilojoules. So what that's left is on the reaction side, we have those two numbers, 604 and 173, which is 777. So the sum of the bond energies on the reactant side is 777 kilojoules plus 4x, where again, x is whatever 
the CH bond energy is, is which we're not given here numerically. All right, so that's the reaction side, and then I intentionally left some blank space because these problems take up a lot of room. So then on the product side, what we're going to have is, in this case, the carbon-carbon bond is now a single bond. So it's going to be one cc single bond. And the number for the carbon-carbon single bond is 338. And then we still have our four CH bonds. As we said, those are the same on reaction product side, which is why we don't need the number, but if we want to just account for them, one, two, three, four. So four CH bonds, which we're calling X, as you said. We don't know the number for that. And then we have two CX bonds. CX there, CX there, one on each side as I've drawn it. So I'll have to add those in. So the CH, CX bond strength is 249. Again, that number was variable in this problem, so it might have been something different for you, but you'll still use whatever number you had. So 1 times 249 kilojoules, that's 2, or sorry, 2 times 49, 249, whoops. So that should be 498. All right, so when we add those together, did I pick bad numbers, or does this work out okay? We get 836. Plus 4x again, 4 CH bonds. Alright, so now we're ready to do the delta E, which is going to be, so this is the sum of the bond energies on the product side, that number there, or that expression there. So now we're going to do the sum of the bond energies on the reactants minus products to get delta E. Which again, this could also be listed as delta H, we would calculate it the same way in this type of problem. So it's reactants minus products when we're doing it this way. So it's going to be 777 kilojoules plus 4x minus 836 kilojoules minus 4x. Alright, so the x's cancel out. I go plus 4x, sorry, it's still plus 4x. Plus 4x minus 4x there. So it's just going to be 777 minus 836, which is minus 59 kilojoules. All right, so those problems are a little bit time consuming. There's nothing terribly difficult about them mathematically, but you have to make sure you account for how many of each bond energy you have, and then don't leave any out when you're adding them up. And in this case, we didn't have one of the bond energies, but it's the same on the reactant product side. Four CH bonds here, four CH bonds there, reactants minus products, so you just subtract them out. The dog's barking. All right, let's resume. I hope that my dog keeps quiet the rest of the time so I can do this. All right, so this next problem here deals with calculating specific heat capacity. Uh, sorry, calculating heat using the specific heat capacity. So we learn now also an equation for Q. So in this course we have you know, delta E equation, which we used in the first problem, and then equations for Q and W, the one for W we don't use a lot, and I don't think they cover it here, but we have an equation for Q that we're going to use here. So we're trying to calculate the heat in kilojoules when 123 grams of water is heated from 12.3 to 42.5 degrees Celsius, and here we gave you specific heat capacity of water. So anytime you're calculating Q, we're going to use this equation. This equation also is important for calorimetry problems, which we'll do at least one of today. So Q is equal to MC delta T. So that famous equation, a lot of students pronounce it as Q equals M cat, which I don't like because delta is not the letter A, but if that helps you remember it, go for it. Um, and so we're going to use MC delta T. And for most of these problems, it's just putting in numbers and occasionally we have to deal with units and things like that, but this one is pretty straightforward. So we're going to put for mass is the, you know, M is the mass of substance that we're heating up, in this case the water, or, or that's releasing the heat if it was an exothermic process. So it's 123 grams of water. The heat capacity was given here as 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Remember that can be per gram degree Celsius or gram Kelvin because we're doing delta T here, which is the same for Celsius and Kelvin. But then we have to calculate delta T. Remember that delta T is final minus initial, or delta anything is final minus initial. 
So here's the two temperatures. We're going from 12.3 to 42.5. So the final temperature is 42.5 degrees Celsius. And the initial temperature is 12.3. And so when we subtract those two, we get 30 something. 30.2. And it should be positive because the temperature is increasing. So that's our delta T, so we put that in there. So when we calculate that, remember that heat capacity is in joules. So the initial answer we're going to get is not in kilojoules, but in joules. So the number we get is 15,542. That's plenty of significant figures. Joules, but they want the answer in kilojoules. So we have to divide that by 1,000. One kilojoule is 1,000 joules. So that comes out to, if the correct number of significant figures, 15.5 kilojoules. All right, so in this problem, it's again, a pretty straightforward equation, just three numbers multiplied together. We did have to take care of units at the end to convert joules to kilojoules. So remember that your, your specific key capacities conventionally are given in joules per degree, gram degree Celsius, not kilojoules. So you have to pay close attention to that when you're, when you're doing problems like this. All right, and then this problem uses the same concept, but for a little bit different application, where now we're going to determine the specific heat capacity of a substance. This is one of the classic calorimetry problems that we do. Um, here, the word calorimeter doesn't appear in the problem, but that's essentially what it is. We're using an insulated coffee cup as our calorimeter. So we're taking a sample of an alloy, which is just a metal, and it's initially at 98 Celsius. We place it into 54.5 grams of water, which is at 22 Celsius in an insulated coffee cup. So what we should recognize conceptually is that we're putting a hot piece of metal into colder water. So there's going to be heat transfer between them. And they're going to transfer heat from the hotter substance, the alloy, to the colder substance, the water. And they're going to transfer that heat until the temperature is the same. So we're assuming that no heat is absorbed by the cup. So we're assuming that all the heat is absorbed by the water here, which makes it a little bit simpler mathematically. Um, if the final temperature of the system is 31.1 degrees Celsius, what is the specific heat capacity of the alloy? So again, this is that temperature they get to when, they've, when both the alloy and the water have reached the same temperature and no more heat transfer is occurring, and that's where the system stops, so we're going to use that as our final temperature for both. So in problems like this, what we have to realize is that the heat term for one substance is equal and opposite to the heat term for the other when they're transferring heat between them. So again, in this problem here, we're assuming that all the heat is absorbed by the water because we're assuming that no heat is absorbed by the cup itself. So the heat for the alloy is equal and opposite to the heat for the water. Um, all right, so that's, that's going to be the, um, the, the equation we said. Now we can put the negative sign on either side of the equation. So it could be negative Q alloy equals Q water, or as I've written it here, um, it doesn't really matter mathematically, they, they're equivalent, it's just the concept is that you know, the amount of heat that's lost by one substance is going to be gained by the other and vice versa. So it's the same amount of heat, but the sign is opposite because again, one of them is losing heat, one of them is gaining heat, and so we have to make sure the signs are, are set correctly. Alright, so now from there we can just start putting numbers in if that's how we'd like to do it. So remember, for each of these substances, Q is equal to MC delta T, so we're going to do that on both sides. So again, the, the mass of the alloy times its heat capacity times its delta T is equal and opposite to the mass of the water times the heat capacity of water times the delta T for the water. So we're going to have these three terms for both substances, and we're going to set them equal and opposite to each other. So the mass of the alloy is 12.3 grams. So if you want to just start putting numbers in without doing too much algebra, we can go ahead and do that. So 12.3 grams, the heat capacity of the alloys are unknown, so we're going to solve for that. And then delta T for the alloy, they have the same final temperature, which is 31.1 degrees Celsius. And then the initial temperature for the alloy is 98, so if we want to put that in as one set number, 31.1 minus 98 is negative 66.9. So that's delta T for the alloy. It's losing heat to the water, so it's going down in temperature. And then on the other side, we have the water. So here we're telling you we have 54.5 grams of water. 
The heat capacity of water is given here, and it's one that we should know, 4.184. And I'll rewrite that as grams, degrees Celsius, and temperatures in Celsius, but again, numerically it's the same. And then delta T for the water, it goes to the same final temperature of 31.1 degrees Celsius, and it started out at 22. So that's gonna be 9.1 degrees Celsius. Grams to be Celsius. I'm going to try to do that right. I can't do math this early in the morning. 9.1 is delta T for water. And again, it's positive in this case. And we need a minus sign out front of that to make sure that the signs are the same on both sides, negative on both sides. But I almost forgot that, but then you need that minus sign on one side of the equation as we talked about. All right, so then from here we are ready to solve for the heat capacity of the alloy. So the heat capacity of the alloy, doing a little bit of algebra, we have, let's make sure I get this right. Hang on, I'm gonna need a second to calculate this out. So you can calculate it out while you're waiting for me. I should probably double check that number in case it's wrong, but you guys will double check for me anyway. So 2.52 joules per gram Celsius for whatever this alloy is, that's going to be the heat capacity. So that's just algebra at this point. We're just multiplying one side, dividing by the other two numbers, and we're good to go. I'm going to double check that number because if I put a wrong number on here, you guys are not going to like it. All right, so I got the same number twice, so that's probably right. 2.52 joules per gram, gram degree Celsius is the heat capacity for this alloy. And again, it was a numerical question in Blackboard, so you would not include the units, but that's what they would be in this problem. All right, so that's a typical calorimetry problem where we're using just a physical process of heat transfer and then measuring an unknown heat capacity. Um, the next couple of questions I'm doing are gonna deal with thermochemical equations. Um, so the first one here just sort of deals with the properties of delta H. So we gave you a thermochemical equation, 2NO plus O2 goes to 2NO2. Let's just for, new, just for keeping track of everything, let's call that equation one. So that's our given equation with a known delta H. And now we're trying to calculate delta H for this equation here, NO2 going to NO plus one half O2. So we'll call this equation two. So what we have to do in this problem is we only have, you know, one equation given here. So we have to see, like, what is the relationship between the given equation and the one we're trying to find delta H from. Why don't you stop it? Sorry, my dog is acting up again. He does not want me to do this video today. All right, uh, so we have those two equations there. And so what we have to recognize is that equation two here... So what did we do to go from equation one to equation two? So we flipped the equation, because in equation one, NO and O2 are the reactants, and NO2 is the product. In equation two, it's the opposite. We have NO2 as a reactant, NO and O2 as products. So we flipped it, which means we changed the sign in sort of mathematical terms. And then we also have the coefficients. So the coefficients here are two, one, two. And then for those substances, they're going to be 1, 1 half, and 1. So equation 2 is minus 1 half times equation 1 mathematically. We flipped it, and we multiplied the coefficients by 1 half. So what that means then is delta H for equation 2 is going to be just minus 1 half times delta H for equation 1. All right? Because, again, if we flip, flip the reaction, we change the signs of delta H. And then if we multiply the coefficients by half, the delta H scales by the same amount. All right, so we're gonna, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna finish this up. We're gonna say that delta H for equation two is minus one half times delta H for equation one. Delta H for equation one is minus 1140 kilojoules. I think this might have been a multiple choice question, but. Anyway, what we get is plus 570 kilojoules. 
All right, so we changed the sign of delta H because we changed the direction of the reaction. We switched the reactants and the products. And then we multiplied it by half because the coefficients are half as big in the second equation. So that one just required us to use the properties of delta H and how it changes as a function of the coefficients and the order of the reaction. Um, so we'll go to the next one here in a second. All right, we'll resume and that should be the last interruption I have. All right, so we're gonna go on now and we're gonna use a similar concept now in these next two problems, which are Hess's Law. So these are types of problems where, again, we're trying to calculate delta H for some reaction. And we're given, in this case, two equations that we have to figure out how to combine. All right, so again, this is our unknown delta H. And we're giving you two equations with known delta H values. In this case, N2 plus O2 going to 2 and O, and then NO plus half Cl2 and NOCl. So we have delta H's for both of these. Let's call them equation one and equation two. So this is that type of problem where it's a little bit like putting a puzzle together. We have to figure out how do we combine these two given equations, equations one and two, to get this overall equation here. All right, so if we look at this, um, problem here. So what we'll see is that the, the reaction we're trying to calculate delta H for has one half N2 as a product. So what we, want, what we want to try to do is find the reactants and the products in this equation here, when we're trying to find delta H for, that only appear once in the set of equations below. Um, so there's a couple options for this, but if we look at you know, NOCl, that only appears here in the second equation, but then N2 and O2, they're going to show up in the first equation here. So, so, the, the, so it should be pretty straightforward how to add those together. So what we want is we want one half N2 and one half O2 as products in, the, in this equation here. Equation one down here has one N2 and one O2 as reactants. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip equation one so that N2 and O2 go to the product side, which is where we want them, and then we're going to multiply it by half. So we're gonna do the minus one half times equation one. So we're gonna take this whole equation, flip it, and multiply the coefficients by a half. So it's gonna become NO going to one half N2 plus one half O2. So we flip the equation and multiply the coefficients by a half, and then this delta H is gonna be minus one half times delta H one, which is 186 kilojoules divided by two, and then change the sign, 180.6. So it's gonna be 90.3, and then it becomes negative. All right, so we flipped this first equation, multiply the coefficients by a half, so we flip the sign of delta H and multiply it by a half, so it becomes minus 90.3. And then for equation two, equation two has NOCl as a product, but we want NOCl on the reactant side for the equation we're trying to calculate delta H for, so we need to flip equation two. But in this case, we don't need to change the coefficients because this has a coefficient of one in front of NOCl, and the equation we're looking at has an equation of one. Moreover, we have one half Cl2 here as a reactant, and by flipping it, we put one half Cl2 in the product side. So looking at either of those, we know that we just have to flip the second equation. We don't have to change the coefficients. So then we just swap reactants and products. So it's gonna be NOCl going to NO plus one half Cl2. And then the delta H that we modify is just gonna be the negative of delta H2, because all we did was flip it. So that becomes positive 38.6 kilojoules. So then what we can do is we can add these two together. You can double check to make sure that the equations add correctly. So we have here NO as a reactant, which cancels with the NO that's on the product side. And then the only pro reactant that's left is NOCl. And then on the product side, we have half N2, half O2, half Cl2, which is exactly what we want. So the two equations that we've modified add up correctly to give this equation up here. And then the delta H's are gonna be additive as well. So it's just gonna be this number there, minus 90.3, the modified delta H1, plus the second delta H, which is 38.6.
And so what that comes out to then, give me one second, is minus 51.7 kilojoules. All right, and so that's how we would get the delta H for that with two equations. We just have to figure out how to add them together and modify them and so on. So that's a pretty typical Hess's law problem, and we'll do one more of those now that's just a little bit more complicated because it has three equations instead of, instead of two. So we're looking for delta H for this equation here, carbon plus two sulfur going to carbon disulfide. Now this is actually a formation equation because we're, although not exactly though, because we're not using the standard state for sulfur, we're using S instead of S8, but it's, time, it's sort of related to a, to a formation equation nonetheless. All right, and so again, we look for reactants and products in this equation here that appear only once in the given equations. So our overall equation has carbon as a reactant, and carbon only shows up in equation one down here. So we're going to just use equation one as is because we want one carbon on the reactant side. So we don't need to change the direction of it, and we don't need to change the coefficients. So we're going to use equation one as given. And I'm going to leave out the little solid, liquid, and gas designators, but those are could be there. So we're going to use that one as is, and so since we didn't change it, we don't change as delta H. So this is the formation equation for carbon dioxide. All right, and then we see that the equation we're trying to find delta H for has two sulfur solid as a reactant, and sulfur only appears here in equation two but it's on the product side and it only has a coefficient of one. So what we're gonna do for equation two is we're gonna flip it so that sulfur ends up as a reactant instead of a product, and we're gonna multiply everything by two so that the sulfur has a coefficient of two in front of it. So we're gonna do negative two times equation two. So we're gonna flip it and double it. So it's gonna become two sulfur plus two O2 goes to SO2. 2SO2. And so the delta H for this is going to be negative 2 times the second delta H because again we flipped it and we doubled it. So that's going to be a pretty large negative number. So it's going to be 296.8 times negative 2. It's going to be minus 593.6. All right, and then finally, the last equation, we need CS2 as a product. Equation three has CS2 as a reactant. They have both, we have a coefficient of one here for CS2 in the equation we're looking for, and this one also has a coefficient of one. So we don't need to change any of the coefficients, we just need to flip equation three. So we're gonna flip the whole thing, so that's gonna become CO2 plus two SO2 goes to CS2 plus 3O2. So in these types of problems, there's a lot of times there's a lot of intermediates to deal with, which are substances that are you know formed in one of the equations and used up in another. So those need to balance out as well. But if, again, if we trust ourselves to look correctly at the reactants and products in our overall equation and balance according to that, everything should work out with intermediates. And we'll double check that here at the end. So the delta H for this, we just flip the direction of equation three. So all I do is, is flip the sign for delta H three. So that becomes positive 1076.8 kilojoules. All right, so now we have these three equations here. So that should be negative. We, we didn't want to lose the sign there. And then we're going to make sure they add up together correctly. So we have carbon. Here is a reactant, which doesn't cancel out with anything. All right, so for O2, we have a lot going on with O2, but we have O2 plus two O2s. So we have three O2s on the reactant side, and then this equation has three O2 on the product side. So all the O2 cancels out. Three total on the reactant side, three on the product side, so that doesn't carry through. We have two sulfurs, which doesn't cancel out with anything. And then here we have CO2 as a reactant, and then CO2 as a product over here. So it's gonna cancel itself out. And then finally, SO2, we have two SO2s here as a reactant, but two SO2s there as a product, so they cancel out as well. And then all that's left on the product side is CS2. So that's the equation we were looking for, and then we just have to add together the delta H's that we got 
to get the overall delta H. So it's going to be these three numbers added together, minus 393.5 kilojoules plus minus 593.6 kilojoules plus 1076.8 kilojoules. So those three numbers added together. So let's see what that comes out to. Comes out to a positive number, 89.7 kilojoules. All right, so that's a typical Hess's Law problem with three equations. Now, as I said, there's a lot of intermediates here. O2, you know, forms in two of these equations and ends up, you know, as a product, or, you know, is used in two equations and as a product from the third, CO2, SO2. It's hard to sometimes balance the intermediates out, especially things like O2, which appear in all three equations. But like I said, focus on the reactants and the products in the overall equation and where they appear in the given equation, especially those that only appear once, which is true for all these three you can use that as your sort of guide for how to rearrange the three equations. And if you do that correctly, add them up, the overall equation comes out, and the delta H is just the sum of the three modified delta H values. All right, the last two problems here are ones that we did not do too badly on, actually. Um, but there, this is a problem type that I didn't really cover directly in class. I want to make sure I go through it here. Um, now, this is dealing with thermochemical equations, but it's using a thermochemical equation almost in the context of stoichiometry. So we'll see how that works here. So we have this equation here. So this is one variation of this problem type. We give you a thermochemical equation, which is a balanced chemical equation and a delta H value along with it. And it says, with that above data, calculate the enthalpy change delta H when 89.6 grams of SO2 is converted to SO3. So in this equation here, we are telling you delta H when one mole of SO2 is converted to one mole of SO3, but what we're looking for is delta H when 89.6 grams of SO2 is converted to SO3. So this problem here is actually a lot like um, a stoichiometry problem because we're basically treating this delta H, this minus 99.1 kilojoules, as a product of this reaction. So when one mole of SO2 reacts with a half mole of O2 to form one mole of SO3, delta H is minus 99.1 kilojoules. So we can set up conversion factors or ratios involving delta H with any of the coefficients from this equation. That's how we're going to do it here. So it's going to be set up almost identically to a stoichiometry problem. We're looking for delta H. We're starting with 89.6 grams of SO2. Just like any other stoichiometry problem, convert to moles first. So one mole of SO2 has a mass. We have to find the molar mass of SO2. So that's going to be 32.07 plus 64, so it's 96.07 grams per mole for SO2. So that's how many moles of SO2 we have. And then from there, as I said, we can use delta H in combination with any of the, mole, the, the coefficients in the equation. So what we want is moles of SO2 to cancel out. We want to figure out how many kilojoules of heat that, re, uh, that results in. So the delta H is minus 99.1 kilojoules and the coefficient in front of SO2 is a one. There's no coefficient there. So that's 99.1 kilojoules per one mole of SO2. So moles of SO2 cancel out and that gives us a delta H value in kilojoules. So again, it's almost identical to stoichiometry. We're just using that numerically along with mole convergence like we would in a stoichiometry problem. So that comes out to minus 92.4 kilojoules. So that's almost one mole of SO2, so it's not a terribly different number, but it's a little bit less than one mole of SO2. So what we get is a little bit less in terms of delta H for, for that reaction. So that's how we use a thermochemical equation to calculate delta H in this context. And then there's the other way to do it, um, which is shown here where we're giving you now, again, a, a, a combustion enthalpy in this case, the combustion of carbon, um, which is minus 393 kilojoules. And then we're saying here we want 693 kilojoules of heat needed from the combustion, so how much carbon must be consumed? So here we're kind of going the opposite. We're giving you how much heat we're trying to produce and figuring out how much substance do we need to react for that to happen. 
So this is again going to be set up exactly like a stoichiometry problem. We're looking for the grams of carbon that are needed to produce this much heat. So we're producing 693 kilojoules. Now don't be too thrown off by the signs here. It's positive 693 kilojoules, but that's because that's how much heat we're producing from the combustion. So this negative 393 just tells us that that much heat is being produced by the combustion. So we can basically leave out the signs here. We're just looking for a magnitude. We can't have a negative mass, obviously. Okay, so that's how much heat we're trying to produce. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the thermochemical equation as a conversion factor. So we want kilojoules to cancel out, and we want to find how many moles of substance that is. In this case, carbon is the substance we're looking at. So what we do is we write that as a conversion factor. So for 393 kilojoules, that's our delta H, that corresponds to the combustion of one mole of carbon. It's not always going to be one here. The coefficient could be something other than one. But it's a coefficient of one here, so it's going to be one mole produces 393 kilojoules. And then from there, we just need grams of carbon, so we're going to use the atomic mass of carbon, which is 12.01 grams per mole from the periodic table. All right, so that's going to be, again, a relatively simple conversion involving concepts related to stoichiometry. And what I came up with I did the math correctly, was 21.2 grams of carbon. So if we burn 21.2 grams of carbon, we will produce 693 kilojoules of heat. Again, delta H is technically negative because it's an exothermic reaction, but that's how much heat in absolute sense is produced. So we just use that as a ratio, moles to kilojoules, just like we did in the last one, just in a little bit opposite direction this time. All right, so that takes me to the end of this review. Um, if there's any additional questions on Chapter 7, of course, please come find me, and um, I will see you guys in class tomorrow.